This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Morning, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be at this time. If it's like in your east, it's noon. Good afternoon. A couple of minutes later, but here at West, nine o'clock in the morning, we're all awake, I hope. And uh, thanks for joining me here. You are here live with Dr. Jeff Werber, your host for the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. I'm here for you, here for your pets. Anything you want to talk about, fair game. Uh, you have questions, you have concerns, you have comments, whatever you want to do, uh, just let me know. I also, as you know, go through some of the news. There are some good stories we talk about, but of course, uh, you guys come first. So if there's anything that you want to talk about, now is the time to ask. How to get a hold of me? Very easy. Best way to do it is you go on to PetLifeRadio.com or Instagram. Pet Life Radio, you click on shows, scroll down to Ask the Best with Dr. Jeff. There'll be a Zoom link left for you there. Just click on the link and you are here live with me, with your pet, and of course, our producer, Mark. And if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, telephone 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. And just you know, give us a call. We'll put you on live and you can ask me questions, anything about your pets. So as I am going through our, let's get some, I'm waving to a lot of you, but I want to get some questions. My dog recently had to have his teeth removed since then I've noticed his eyes more goopy. Could it be related? Absolutely. So, you know, there's direct communication between the upper arcade of the mouth, those are the upper teeth, and the nasal sinus. And of course, the nasal sinus has a direct connection with the eyes. Why? Because tear ducts flow from the eyes through the nose. So if there is any infection in the nasal sinus from those bad teeth, then that can back up into the eyes and you can see what we call conjunctivitis, a thick discharge, et cetera, all because of the bad teeth. Now, typically... When we have to extract teeth, obviously we're extracting them for a reason. And the reason is most likely infection. So what I always like to do is even beforehand, if I'm about to do a dental, I'm scheduling a dentistry and we know that, that there are going to be some extractions. The teeth are rotten, they're loose. I like to start for about five days before the procedure, get them started on antibiotics because we know that in the procedure itself, we're definitely going to be introducing bacteria into the blood. And then we can have actually some some pretty bad disease. As a matter of fact, and I say this all the time when people say, well, God, he's so old. I don't know, I want to do, do the teeth. I don't want to anesthetize him. You don't understand that the anesthesia is less of a risk in an otherwise healthy dog. Of course, check him out first, take x-rays, do blood work, make sure they can handle the anesthesia. But if you ignore bad teeth, then we're concerned about something much worse. And that is that the oral flora, the bacteria in the mouth, once they enter the bloodstream, seem to colonize in two key places. Number one, the heart valves, we call that bacterial endocarditis. Number two, the glomerulonephritis, which is the glomerulus is the filtration system within a kidney. And when they get infected, and usually often from the oral flora, the bacteria that are in the mouth, then we start having kidney failure, kidney disease. And of course, we get bacterial endocarditis, which is heart valve disease. So the answer is, is there a risk not to do the teeth? And I think the risk is greater not to do them than to do them so long as the that checks out. Remember, I say it all the time. My uh, last Labrador, 15 years old, and I subjected him to a very long procedure because he's, he checked out. And because of that procedure, I basically saved his life. And he lived to 16 and a half, which is unbelievable. So yes, there's connection. He should be on antibiotics, have the eyes checked, of course, probably start him on some antibiotics and, uh, and oxy also topical antibiotics for the eye itself. And that should help. If not, then we need to go to plan B. But I would definitely do that. Let's see. I know another question came in. Uh, what causes the smell of paws dogs and how do you treat it? So, Mama Sue. So, what causes them? Usually when dogs' pads smell, it's infection. And what we often see, more so in dogs, you can have bacterial too, but we see a lot of yeast. Usually when you have that musty odor, whether it's the skin itself all over, whether it's just the feet, whether it's the ears, that is oftentimes a malassezia infection which is a yeast infection of the skin and the paws. And remember one thing about paws, dogs don't really sweat like we do. However, there are two tissues in a dog's body that do sweat, have what we call ecrine sweat glands. And those two parts of the body are similar to each other in the type of tissue, but dissimilar to every other part of the body. 
And what are those? The nose. And any guesses? Well, save time. The pads of the feet. If you hold up a dog's pads to their nose, you'll see it's the same kind of tissue. Well, therefore, when dogs sweat, which they do from their feet and their nose, first of all, that's why dogs have to pant for heat control. They don't have enough surface area on the body to regulate heat through sweating. So that's why they pant. But more importantly, because of that, feet are oftentimes a great source of infection, often yeast infection, and that's what you're smelling. So you want to keep the feet clean. You need to dry them well. My favorite product is hard to get right now. It seems to be backward in a lot of places. That's Neo Pred-F powder, but any type of drying agent. And there's a spray for humans. I think it's called Lotrimin spray, and it's an antifungal, but it's in, even though it sprays out of a can, it's a talc. So uh, I don't know what the, the base is, but it also is drying. So I would recommend that too in a pinch if you can't get a hold of the Neo Pred-F powder. But uh, keeping them dry and clean is the answer. Smelly paws, let's see. Three-year-old Maltese doing a lot of marking. Will neuter help cut down the marking behavior? Yes, it will. I wouldn't say it's 100%, but it certainly will help. Intact males like to mark. And there are other dogs that like to mark too. Now, my dogs, I have five, all neutered. Well, one of them is a female. She's spayed. And um, they still, uh, when they go for a walk, this is a male thing. They like to, now my big Labrador, he likes to let it all out at once. He just gets a one long pee. And which is fine with me. But some of the little guys now, because they, they could be they're younger, but they still like to every time, especially my Frenchie. My Frenchie is that macho male obnoxious dog. And he wants to pee on every tree. And then when he does, some of the other dogs, my little terrier, my little mutts, they they go and they'll lift their leg to pee, but nothing comes out. They're empty. But it's that act of wanting to, I don't know, keep up with the Joneses. He said, Well, if he can mark, I want to mark too. So anyway, but uh, no. Neutering should definitely help. It'll take out that urge to, you know, to, to let every male, other male in the neighborhood know who's there, who's boss. So, uh, yeah, um, I find it does help. Uh, let's see. He didn't have any antibodies before. He healed the extraction. Should be antibodies now. Well, if he does have uh, the goopy eyes, if there's no nasal discharge and it's just coming from the eyes, then maybe just try topical antibiotic, something for the eyes first by itself and see if he has any other signs of a respiratory infection, sneezing, snotty nose, nasal discharge, then I would put him on oral antibiotics as well. But it's good that he's um, fully healed from the dentistry. How many teeth were extracted? Let, let me know. That would help. So I want more questions. So anyway, in the meantime, let's talk about a case. I'd like to share some of the things I had this week. And I had a really, really interesting case. I was the third opinion. The first opinion was her general practitioner. They kind of live far away. I don't know how they got my name. Then they went to a specialist and this problem still persisted. And they got my name and they came to see me. And trust me, I, I always feel weird seeing a case after it had seen a specialist. But one of the things I find is that a lot of specialists have their blinders on. All they think about is their specialty and they don't think outside the box. Whereas a general practitioner who doesn't have a specialty like myself, I'm like that jack of all trades, master of none. We still think of all these different possibilities. So dog comes in, urinary problem. What is the urinary problem? It does a lot of peeing, squatting a lot to pee. And I clearly ask, is it mostly like knowingly squatting to urinate or is it like waking up in this little puddle? And they, it's just very interesting, the distinction. And the difference is no, usually she squats. Sometimes she does, you know, it just seems to come out. Now, mind you, she is a two-year-old intact, meaning she's not spayed female. So they, their GP says, we got to go to a specialist. Specialist is worried about something, which was a good, certainly on my list, just from hearing the history, something called ectopic ureters. Those are ureters. Those are the, the tubes that carry urine from the kidneys into the bladder. And if they enter into the bladder beyond that anal sphincter, then there, there's always going to be urine being made, not being able to help held in because the, the urine is entering after the bladder sphincter, which is the muscle that closes up the bladder to control urination. But if that were the case, there would always be dribbling. And I clearly asked, is there always? No, rarely. It's usually she's squatting. So now I'm thinking, okay, we got to go backwards. But they did a, a CT scan and it shows, yes, there were topic errors, but they do enter into the bladder in an, in an abnormal location, but still inside the bladder. So that means that the bladder sphincter muscle should be working but something else is going on. So they actually said no resolution. They actually told them to not spay her yet. Maybe the estrogen influence will tighten up that bladder sphincter and wait. I don't know if I agreed. And she was still showing signs of, of an infection. So I said, you know what? What did the ultrasound show? There was no ultrasound. 
no ultrasound. A guy does a CT without an ultrasound first? I was a little shocked. So I said, no, I want to look at the bladder itself. Maybe there's bladder wall. Maybe there's something that may not show up on the CT. They did a beautiful job showing the, the lighting up where the urine is entering the bladder with contrast, but I still want to see more. So I do an ultrasound. The bladder, the first thing that struck me is the bladder wasn't round. Usually it's round, but it was like oblong. It was like almost flat, like it was being pushed. And so it was long and thin instead of round. That was surprising. So now I'm looking at the rest of the, the abdomen because I, I usually start in the bladder and go up and I'm seeing these huge, huge pockets of what I didn't know what it was, but there were like pockets, like, you know, like almost like a bunch of water balloons. And I stick a needle into one of them and I get this disgusting dark brown fluid coming out. And I get compared that obviously with the urine I collected, which was yellow, clear urine. And I said, okay, we need to explore this dog like today. I said, was it for breakfast? No, it wasn't for breakfast. So I go in. This dog had, I don't know whether it was a, what we call hydro uterus, where the uterus was full of this liquid, could have been a form of pyometra. But interestingly, it must have been what we call a closed pyo, because none of that brown, disgusting stuff was coming out of the vulva, of the vaginal canal. So that worried me. That's why it was so big. The fluid kept building up and building up and building up. And that's what was putting pressure on the poor bladder. That's why she was peeing all the time and squatting because every time there was so much pressure being put on the bladder wall, the signal goes to the brain that I got to pee. And that's what was going on. So we, of course, we anesthetize the dog, go in. This was the most, it was five pounds. The dog only weighed like close to 50 pounds, five pounds of uterus. It was huge. I'm going to post it this week. You guys should look and see it. It was unbelievable. And so, I mean, this poor dog, can you imagine going weeks, nobody figuring it out, nobody even doing the simple, basic abdominal ultrasound? It just blew my mind. So look, I'm talking, this is basic veterinary medicine. This is not, you know, Jeff Werber being some amazing guy. No, I'm not. I'm just a routine, regular GP, but it shows important how sometimes the GP might be a good choice because they kind of have to look at everything because they don't know anything particularly special. Whereas the internists, or the, the surgeons or, or whatever the specialist may be, that's all they're thinking. And um, I just find that it made sense to me, but still, I was rather shocked. Okay, there you go. Can a dog experience depression when losing a brother they've grown up with? Absolutely, absolutely. And we see it all the time. Let me give you an interesting story. So when I was uh, in vet school, I had two Labradors. I had my lab that I had. He went to college with me. His name was Thor. And then we wanted to get a Thor playmate. So we got we bred, I was working at a hospital at the time, and we bred one of my client's dogs with my, a friend of mine who was a veterinarian, an equine vet that I used to work with, and um, beautiful puppies, black labs, adorable. And we picked one, and we named him Woody. So a year later, Thor, 12-something years old, passes away. We had severe pancreatitis. It was a terrible story. But anyway, he passes away. And it was just before we were going back up to Davis, my wife and I, for my next year of school, my second year of vet school. And so we used to, when we had both cars down in LA for the summer, we would take both cars. So usually I take one dog, she would take the other dog. So we get to back up to Davis and we pull in the driveway of our house and Woody runs in expecting, I wasn't with Thor on the trip up home, but Thor passed away and there was no Thor anymore. And he runs into the house trying to play with Thor and nothing. He's running from room to room, door to door. Now, for the next several days, we had, they each had their own bed in our living room. And Woody would never be caught alive on Thor's bed. That was just, that was a no no. And he would go up to the bed, sniff it, circle, lie down, and whimper. So you know, you know that he experienced the loss and his buddy wasn't there anymore. And of course, that destroyed us. So, of course, what we do, we got a hold of my friend, the vet, who had this gorgeous yellow lab named Monty. And I had a client who had a yellow lab and wanted to breed. And we had a yellow and yellow, you know, is you're going to have yellow puppies. And we set it up. We got the pick of the litter and we brought home Chester. So now, and Woody and Chester, they literally kind of grew up, they're only a year and a half apart in age. Same dad, they were half brothers. And uh, uh, it was, that was great. So uh, yes, the truth is they do, uh, unfortunately, sadly, experience it. In some cases, they don't. You know, a lot of times when I do house call euthanasias, which I do a lot of, and I've been doing it for a zillion years, way before the trend, I, I, it was, um, I find it amazing to do and I, I rewarding for me. I think that it's great for the dogs. And anyway, I was um, doing these house call euthanasias and I realized that some people like to have 
there are other dogs with them and some don't. And I find that a lot of times what we'll do is we'll bring the other dog, dog or dogs into the room where the now deceased dog is still lying on, on his or her favorite bed and they sniff around. Sometimes you get reactions. Sometimes you, they lick them. Sometimes they just take a sniff and walk away. And maybe, maybe I'm thinking, you know, again, anthropomorphizing here, that and deep inside they say, all right, now I'm Kingpin. And before it was the other dog. So um, I'm going to miss you, but I'm glad, I'm glad you're not here anymore. So, uh, you know, there's no way to tell, but I, I've seen, you know, all time. Now, okay, littermate syndrome. I'm not 100% familiar with that term, but I, I'm going to look it up. What are your thoughts on adopting siblings together? I'm a fan. You know, it's interesting when we got Chester, you know, since we knew the mom and knew the dad for a while, when they were little pups, we would get them together, okay, like a play date in the park. Then as they all started reaching sexual maturity, they're all brothers. There were nine dogs, nine males, all nine were males, okay? And, you know, that's why we always joke. You know, we had pick of the litter. We always picked the wrong one. Chester was a moron. No, he, he, was, he was such a great dog. He was the cutest thing ever. Beautiful dog. But when they all got to be around six, seven months of age, those same cute dogs that were around, you know, play together in the park and run around and chase each other, they wanted to kill each other. So um, it's hard to tell. Maybe when they're always raised together every day as siblings, then it'll be fine. But I do know a lot of people that have adopted two brothers, sisters, whatever, and they do just fine. So uh, yeah, there may be some sibling rivalry at some point, maybe over certain things, but any dog will do that. It's not necessarily because they were related. The question is, do they know? They know they recognize each other from growing up and always being together, but do they actually understand conceptually that they are related, that they are actual siblings? I don't know. I don't know the answer. Do they, you know, who knows? And, and you can't like say, oh, by the way, this is your brother. That's a word. You know, you, we always call brothers and sisters dogs that are not siblings, or not even related at all. But we say, be nice to your brother. So it's hard to tell. All right. We are going to, before we go to the, uh, ah, good. I like that. Okay. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Cat McCauley official. Great, great, great um, comment. So we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. We, when we come back, we're going to talk about that and love to hear your input on that as well. And so we'll be right back after these short words from our sponsors here on Pet Life Radio. How many of you have pets? My hand's raised. Now think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life. And that pet is lucky to have you too. But unfortunately, there are countless pets out there that don't have a home to call their own. However, Bob's from Skechers is trying to change that. So we developed Bob's for dogs and cats to help pets in need. With every purchase of adorable Bob's footwear or fun, stylish apparel, or even the cutest Bob's pet accessories, Skechers makes a donation to Petco Love to help save shelter pets. And with your help, we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and raised over $7 million. So while you're getting style and comfort with features like Skechers' famous memory foam cushioning, you're also helping to save an adorable pet in need and helping another lucky owner be connected with a future best friend and companion because happiness is having a loving pet by your side. Find Bob's at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, select pet co-locations, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, and we're back. We talked about this, and I wanted to talk about this. It came up last week, and is how can I help my dog's anxiety from loud sounds, fireworks, she trembles all night long. So, I mean, the short answer is, and people usually come up with these questions, a week before the fireworks, 4th of July, at that point, there's nothing you really can do other than drugs. And you can start with some of the more natural calming agents, whether it's CBD, whether it's Benadryl, valerian, passionflower, or chamomile, anything that's going to just chill them out. Um, I always say, put them in, a, in their separate room, maybe play some soft music. They seem to thrive and like classical music and just get them to chill away from the commotion. All right. One thing you don't want to do is give them tons of positive reward. And I don't even mean mean. I mean that when they start shivering and you call them over, oh, poor Bowser, come here, come here, be with dad. Yeah, yeah. What you're doing is you're reinforcing that behavior and then saying, wow, this is great. I wasn't even that afraid anyway, but I'm just doing shake, shaking a little bit. But look at the attention I got. This is good. I, now I know for next time, I'm going to just going to play it up. So we don't want to do that either. So it's being responsive and receptive to them, but 
don't over overdo it and don't let them cuddle up with you necessarily because you're just reinforcing the behavior. So how do you fix it for real? So on any bad behavior, it's not really a bad behavior, but a behavior that's disturbing and you want to stop the behavior, there are two things. We want to desensitize and what we call counter conditioning. We want to take that same input, right? That same stimulus and make them, first of all, not be so afraid of it, but actually to like it. And how do you do it? So you start by putting them in a room. You can download these sounds online. They're so available, whether it's thunder, lightning, it's fireworks, it's loud trucks, it's construction sites, whatever the noises are. And you start playing them, barely audible. You maybe not even hear it, but they do. And when they get used to it, they call it, they should react when it's that soft. And you call them over to you, but they hear it. You call them over to you, sit them next to you, give them a treat. So you're praising the non-response, not the response, but the non-response. And then maybe a couple of times a week do this, but every two or three times, bump up the volume a little bit. Okay. So now it's a little louder, but the same response. So not only are you desensitizing them to the loud sounds as you increase the volume at every session, but or every other third session, give them a couple of sessions of the same volume and then bump it up a little and then a little, little to the point where when they hear it, they're not afraid. They're coming to you because they want their treat. And so what happens is you're counter conditioning. You are conditioning them to actually like that sound and to associate that sound, not with something fearful, but something positive. And um, then they'll sit with you. They'll get their treat. They'll walk away. They don't care. This is great. I love those loud sounds. I'm going to get a treat every time I hear those loud sounds. But anytime you're dealing with behavior modification, this thing of desensitizing, counter conditioning, it's going to take time. You can give yourself a month or two of doing this. So that's why I say it's great that you're asking the question now, because we have now March, we have April, May, June, we have four months before 4th of July. So you know that will, I think, help. That's the, the plan. So keep that up. All right, now, my other sore on his arm, temporary tail, my death stuck on it being linked with leg surgery in August, which is more than healed. Uh, also, the area is not warm, and it doesn't, I guess, doesn't hurt him. I would be, I don't know what kind of leg surgery he had in August, but I would, if it was a, involved a plate with screws, then there is definitely some sort of reaction. So if it was August, that means it's totally healed. I'd be taking an x-ray. I'd be culturing. I don't know if he ever took a culture of the disc of the sore, see what the bacteria are, may need to be placed on a, an appropriate antibiotic. And you can't just guessing. When you have something that's going chronically, you can't just guess and say, well, I used um, Clavmox last time. I used Batrum. No, you got to get a culture. Find out exactly what the bug is, what the best antibiotic is. And if it is something that's chronic and it involves, there's a plate or implant, some sort of implant in the bone, then in my opinion, the implant needs to be removed. And you can remove it as soon as the bone is healed. And getting rid of that implant, a lot of times that implant is a wick for infection. And if you don't remove it, whether it's the screws, in fact, a lot of times when we take these out, what we do is we'll take the implant itself or one of the screws, stick it in a bag and and, in a medium and have it cultured and get an antibiotic sensitivity based on that. And that should solve the problem. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me privately on my Instagram and I will help direct you. But I'm a big stickler for that. And uh, yes. The Frenchies often need to be inseminated. They often need C-section. They usually take care of business on their own. I don't do AR, artificial insemination. There are some reproductive specialists here in LA that do it. So I, as I said, I'm not sure. I don't think they all need it. I mean, I would say for sure they don't all need it. Maybe some do, but they're a much larger percent of dogs that need to have C-sections, of Frenchies needing C-sections, than there are being artificially inseminated. They can handle the insemination. All right. My little is very finicky with their food. Tried so many times, different brands, the same issue. Is there anything I can do? Well, you're doing the right thing. I mean, if they're very finicky, I would check their mouths. Because if it's if it's everything, it's unusual that a dog doesn't like everything. So if they truly don't like everything, then maybe there's something you got to look beyond the food. I would check their mouths, make sure there's no issues inside the mouth, bad teeth, loose teeth, and maybe just they just don't really like to eat that much because of that. Then there are some. If everything in the mouth is fine. Then start feeding. I hate to you know spoil them, but maybe some basic proteins on the human side. See what they like. Maybe they like uh, chicken. Maybe it's fish. Maybe it's beef. Maybe it's it's a rabbit. Who knows? So you try that, and then find kind of where the protein is that they seem to be attracted to, and then you can find pet foods using those proteins. 
If that still isn't working, there are two appetite stimulants that I like. One is called Entice and one is called Mirtazapine, available from your veterinarian. And uh, you could try that and see if you can stimulate the appetite. Then Mirtazapine comes in a pill form or a transdermal where you just put a little smear on the ear and it gets absorbed into the body. Personally, I, I find Entice does a little bit better, but you know, again, it's not my decision. It's your dog's decision. So you could try them both, talk to your veterinarian and see what they, uh, what they think. So all of you, thanks for joining me here. It looks like we have time up. Folks, so for those of you where it applies, happy Passover this week. I will be here next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. So um, if you have any questions during the week, you can always send them to me at Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. Everything gets forwarded to me. You can actually reach out to me, send me a personal message here on Instagram, and I will get back to you. And other than I said, have a good week, everybody. Here in LA, gorgeous day. We're expecting by the end of the week, it's going to be in the 80s. We're finally getting, getting some of our LA weather back. And uh, which is nice. And um, be careful now that it gets nice. Guess what? Fleas and ticks and mosquitoes. We're seeing mosquitoes now in Los Angeles. Talk to your veterinarians. You might want to, if you're not on a heartworm preventative, you might want to start, get your pets heartworm tested. The preventatives are very inexpensive. They are very, very easy to administer. They're once a month chewables. Some of the flea and tick products like Credelio Plus and Semperica Trio actually have incorporated heartworm control in their once a month chew. So you just sort of can take care of everything with one chew. So uh, again, speak to your vets, but we are seeing more and more mosquitoes here. And I think it's time to consider stay on your flea and tick stuff uh, for sure. If you haven't been doing it all year round, which many advocate, you want to start now because springtime is we are seeing fleas. I am already seeing them. So important to get that going. All right. If you have any other specific questions, please reach out to me. And otherwise, we'll see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. And um, stay well. Bye-bye. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.